But Matthew 4.10, go ahead. Yes, sir. So anyway, over there, uh, let me just turn to it. I'm sorry. Let me just, I got to flip my Bible. Yeah, yeah. Away. I'm still bad at text. Let me give you the context. Satan's telling Jesus to worship him, and he says, Depart from me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Yes, that's exactly it. So like, like it says, like Jesus says, you know, worship the Lord your God. You know, Yahweh, your Elohim. So yeah. like, how, why does he not say like worship himself? Okay, well, because in that context, Satan is tempting him to disobey the Father. So in that context, and if you study the scripture, he's saying no, that he's come to the, to the earth to serve the Father and worship him. But since you quote Matthew, don't quote it selectively, because that same word, proskeneo, worship, yes. I want you to go to Matthew 14, 33. 14, okay, the same Matthew that had Jesus saying to Satan, it says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Because Jesus is on earth as a man to serve the Father, to become a servant. And I'll establish that for Matthew. You know, we can't just I, I take... love that passage. I'm there, 1433. Okay, so what did they do to Jesus? Uh, same thing, they worshiped him. So if Jesus meant that you are to worship the Father alone to the exclusion of the Son, meaning that you cannot worship the Son, then when the disciples worship Jesus in the context of walking on water, in fact, if you go to Matthew 14, 27... When it says, do not be afraid, it is I. Actually, in the Greek, if you look at the Greek, it's ego, I me, I am. I am, that's right. Okay. But what's interesting, if you know your Old Testament background, yes, sir. one of the functions of God is that he tramples over the waves and the seas to demonstrate his sovereignty over creation. Right, and, and he controls the water. Say it again, yes. And throughout the book of Isaiah, one of the names of God is Anihu, which in Greek is ego, I me. This is why even liberal scholars or not Christian will tell you this is a theophany where Jesus is unveiling his identity as Yahweh in the flesh because he says, I am, do not be afraid, and echo of Isaiah 43, and he's trampling over the seas, demonstrating his power over the seas, that he has the ability to authorize you to trample the seas as well. Okay. Now, do you agree, by the way, because you said that when you read the Bible, led you to Islam, will Islam allow you to worship Jesus as God's son and call Allah your father? Can I say, well, no, they don't call him father in the Quran. So the very verses that you read that supposedly led you to Islam shows that you should have never been a Muslim because Jesus is saying that that God that he came to serve is his father and Jesus is the son. So I'm still wondering, how did that lead you to Islam when Allah is not the father of anyone? Jesus is not his son. You know, I'm going to be straight up with you. Okay, Sam, you gave a very good argument with that passage. I don't know what to say to her right now. Okay, I'm good. Not, That's fine. I'm not pressuring I'm not, you. You don't need to. Let me give you another one where Jesus yeah. worships. Go to Matthew 21, 15 and 16. Yes, sir. So it says, But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you not hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you, not, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise for yourself. Okay, now, notice what Jesus said to justify the children praising him. Do you see what he did? Because they're angry. Do you see the children are praising you, saying, Hosanna to the son of David? Yep. Right? They're indignant. So what did Jesus say? Yes. Have you not read what is written? And he quotes Psalm 8, verse 2. Yes. Now, you know what the problem with that is? What's that? Psalm 8, verse 1 to 2 is about children praising Jehovah. Why would Jesus quote Psalm 8 to justify children praising him if he's not Jehovah in the flesh? Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I see your point. I really so do. Now, again, let me ask you, I'm not going to Islam. How could this statement lead me to Muhammad when Jesus said, children praising me is something that should be expected because when children on the presence of Jehovah, they cannot help but praise him. And he quotes Psalm 8 too to show, I am that Jehovah God that the children praise when they're in my presence. So Jesus just claimed that he's Jehovah who deserves the worship of Jehovah. Very good. I, I'm, I'll concede because okay. like these weren't the passages I was looking at. Let me be straight up. I was not I'm, looking at these particular passages. I know you weren't. I'm not attacking you. Go to Matthew 1 and let me know if you have another question because I want to walk you through Matthew how when you said this would make Muslim, I chuckled. No, it won't. It'll actually lead you away from Muhammad because Muhammad did not preach the same Jesus or the same God, but that's okay. In Matthew okay. 1 21. Now, whether you believe it's inspired or not, remember, I'm going by your exhortation. You told Christians to read Jesus 
Forget Paul. Well, the where, where I'm going to read Jesus is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew, the angel tells Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus because for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's See what that? the name Yeshua means. Yeshua means God's salvation. Okay, but now you're confusing me, though. It's not God who's saving, meaning the Father. Jesus will save his people from their sins. Read why he's called Jesus. And he, the child, will save his people from their sins. So why is he doing what the Old Testament says only God can do? Psalm 130, verse 8. Jehovah redeems his people. But the child is called God is salvation because the child will save his people from their sins. Now, I'd like to see any prophet in the Old Testament, even the Quran, that saves anyone from their sins. Fair. Now, can I say this in response to this, though? Yes. Like, just so you know my perspective, I'm not countering the argument here. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. But, like, I was kind of just talking about the red letters of Jesus. Now, you just okay. proved me wrong in the previous verse. You rock that. I'll give right. that to you. You just gave me a red letter thing. But what I, how I was seeing it is, like, in the Gospels, it's like the commentary a lot of times is what will try to exalt Jesus. But in Jesus' actual words, like, for example, the prodigal son, he's forgiven, no sacrifice required. In the problem in the, with that one. The, you didn't read the prodigal son correctly because in the context, who's the one coming seeking to save who's lost? Jesus. In the parable, if you've read it carefully, he gives three parables. In the parables, it's describing Jesus because they're complaining, why does he sit with tax collectors and sinners? Right. And Jesus gives three parables to show because I came to save that which is lost. Oh, and snap. Is, so uh, the father in that passage you're saying is really Jesus. Just like the woman who found the lost coin is who? It's um, it's Jesus and was the, the, the and the shepherd, the and the shepherd, shepherd who finds the lost sheep is who? That'd be Christ. Yeah, that's to confirm the Luke nineteen ten, where Jesus red letter says in Luke nineteen ten, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. So how does that prove Islam again? How well, do you any that? prophet do that though? That's what I'm saying. Like the prophet's you know, supposed to bring you repentance. The prophets themselves needed to be saved from their sin and wrath of God. But Jesus is the one who's saving you from your sin and wrath. You know what? You're right. Because if you read verse 9, he says, Salvation has come to this house, for he's a son of Abraham. But who brought that salvation? I, the son of man, came to bring salvation. So, like, it's just, it's, it's really interesting. I was kind of seeing it was, like, historically, because there were Christian Jews that were, like, Unitarian, like the James people. James and Jew don't call Jesus God. You want to bet they do? I don't want to bet. Go to James, <laughs> yeah, no, go to James 1 1. Okay, because I, I like James a lot. He's a brother of Jesus, you know. Yes, enjoy what he says. Because remember, Islamically speaking, you only have one Rab in heaven, Rab Lord in heaven, right? Yeah. And that's Allah. That's not Jesus, right? That's right. And you can't be a servant of anyone other than Allah, correct? That's right. And I do see slave also in the Bible through the word doulos in the Greek. Yes. So I have no problem being a slave. But the, the reason why Americans don't translate it as servant and not slave is because of the Civil War. After the Civil War, it became politically incorrect to translate doulos as slaves. So they started translating it as servant to soften it. But it weakens the gospel because we're, we're supposed to be slaves of Yahweh, right? Yep. So that's how well, apostles are. You said are. slaves of Yahweh, right? Can I be a slave of someone other than Yahweh in heaven? In other words, in heaven... I'm only the slave of Yahweh, right? I can't be the slave of Yahweh and someone else in heaven, right? Yeah. But then you just prove James is either a, he's a kafir, because read how he begins his epistle, James 1.1. 1, 1. All right, I will. James, a bondservant of God, Theos, and of the Lord, Jesus. Oh, man. Where is Jesus? <laughs> he's in heaven. So how could he call Jesus Rab, Lord, and say I'm his slave too? Right. That's like calling him Yahweh. Right. Thank you. So you got it, right? What about James 2.1, though? Okay. James 2.1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, so does he called... Go ahead. Does Kairos necessarily, like Lord Kairos, does that necessarily mean God? No, but you didn't hear the argument. It wasn't meaning God. Jesus is in heaven. Can a monotheist have any other Lord in heaven besides the true God? No. So, but Jesus is in heaven. He's calling him Lord, glorious Lord, and I'm his slave. How if he's a Muslim? That's true. So just let me just read it again. Yeah, and by the way, the Greek is literal. Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. I know, I see that. So can you explain to me if James is a Muslim, preached Islam, 
Why is he saying that Jesus in heaven? He is Lord. He is the glory. And I'm his slave. I think what seals it for your argument is the word glory. I would Even say have glory. Just Islamically, Rabb, Rabbul Alameen, Rabb, Lord of the worlds. Of the you world. cannot call anyone other than Allah Lord, especially in heaven. This is Tawheed al Rububiyyah. So why is James calling Jesus Rabb and he's calling him Lord while he's in heaven and saying, On earth, I'm his Abd, Abdul Yasuh, slave of Jesus, when Islam, that's shirk. Now let's go to Jude, though. Let's see what Jude says. Now, Jude, I like a lot because that demands obedience. Well, you're going to see what he says about Jesus. It's not going to be that helpful to Islam. Go to Jude chapter 1, read verse 1 first. So it says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And Jesus is not on earth, right? No. But now read verse 4, though. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. How can he be a Muslim when he says, Jesus is your only Lord and master in heaven? Fair. You know what? Oh, but verse 5 is going to be a little harder for you, brother. Read verse okay. 5. <laughs> now I would desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. You know how to read in context and you know how to identify the nearest antecedent of the word Lord. In the context, who's the Lord that he just mentioned? I got to look at the previous verse. So the Lord Jesus just, Christ. Now because, I because, desire you. Ah, because he said he's the only Lord. So if he's the only Lord, then who's the Lord that he's mentioning in verse 5? So he's saying like the, the fire in the, in the cloud was Jesus basically. Oh, oh yeah, and he agrees with Paul. And let me give you further proof of that. Did you know that the oldest Greek copies of Jude have the word Jesus instead of Lord in verse 5? That's why if you have a footnote in your NSB, if you have a note, I don't know if you do, it should tell you that or Jesus because the earliest copies of Jude read Jesus. In fact, you know what the earliest copy says? And I have the documentation. I'll give it to you. Yeah, I see that. It says two early manuscripts read Jesus. That's what it says. Okay. Yep. And then only that, did you know the oldest copy of Jude Right, the oldest copy is P72. It actually reads God Christ, Theos Christos, the God Christ delivered them and punished them. So all the copies and the variant readings that arose because scribes make mistakes, and that's the same with the Quran, show you that the context is calling Jesus that Lord, that God who was there during the time of Moses. Now P72, Papyrus 72, if I'm not mistaken, that's about 130 AD. Yep. Second century. So that shows early Christology. Some will date it in the third century, but yes, here in fact, here most translations now will read Jesus because the earliest widespread manuscript copies of Jude have Jesus, but the earliest copy has God Christ. But here it is. Let me show it to you. So now, even with the word Lord, even if you go with Lord in five, still in the context, he just told you who that Lord is, Jesus Christ. So here's the SV. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. One second. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So now Jude just called Jesus your only Lord and Master. And Jude said, I'm his slave. But then he says something even more interesting. If you go to verses 14 and 15, he quotes a prophecy from Enoch. Yes. It was also about these men, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, the Lord who's coming with his myriads to judge the ungodly for their perversion. Do you, you know who that Lord is, according to Jude, the context? The Lord. Yeah, who's the Lord? You don't need to guess because 21 tells you who that Lord is. Verse 21. There it is, Jesus Christ. They never call him, um, they never call like Theos. You don't see like Lord Theos that I know of in the Greek. I, yeah. If it's ever like that, it's always with Jesus after that. You know, yeah. so it'd be like Lord Theos Christos. But it's yes. always like, but whenever Lord is mentioned, it's always mentioned and with Jesus, I notice a lot of times.
Yeah, because in the New Testament, when you say in the Old Testament, Lord God, you're saying Jehovah God. But now yeah. in the New Testament, it's trying to fill out the identity of Jehovah and that it's telling you Jehovah has now become flesh. So it's now Jehovah, Jesus Christ. And that's proven from the very Gospels where it announces John as the voice of Isaiah who prepares people for the coming of Jehovah. Right? Yes. But who was the person that John prepared for? Oh, it was Jesus. But according to the prophecy, John was to prepare for Jehovah. Right, for Yahweh, right. But you just said he prepared for Jesus, and then who's Jesus? Okay, I see a point. Yeah, you're saying he's, he's, he's Yahweh. No, Jesus. according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they say John the Baptist is the voice of Isaiah 40, who prepares the way for Jehovah. And then John says, I come to prepare for Jesus. Ipso facto, Jesus is that Jehovah who became flesh that John announced. Right, because he's referencing to the Old Testament. Now, let me ask you this. Zechariah 12.10, right? Yahweh is talking. yod heh vav -Hey. me whom they have pierced and mourn from him. Yes, what about it? How do you know that's not symbolic? Well, that's I mean, because Zechariah 13.7, you find the verb. It says, he commands the sword. He goes, awake a sword against the shepherd, my fellow, the man who's my fellow, and strike him. And then the sheep will be scattered. So if I read Zechariah 12.10 in context with Zechariah 13.7, that Yahweh is a man. So I know that it's not metaphorical because the same Zechariah goes on to tell me the one who will be struck down, pierced through, is Jehovah's fellow who's called a man. Gaver, meaning man. Who's his companion? I see that. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man, my associate, declares the Lord Elohim of hosts. And now here's the problem, though. The word associate, go look at the Hebrew. It's amith. It means your equal, one who has the same genus you do because you're related by kin, your next of kin. So he says, my associate, emmeth, the word emmeth, whenever it's used in the Old Testament, means next of kin. Some are related to you by genus, meaning you have the same nature. So who is this man that's related to God by nature? Well, yeah. Oh, man. And you know yeah. who quotes that about himself? Jesus does. Jesus. Mark 14, 27. 14. So Jesus just said, I am the man who's next of kin of Jehovah, who will be stuck down by the sword. And therefore, Zechariah 12, 10, that Jehovah who will be pierced is a man. And as a man, he's pierced physically, but then he'll return. And then the Jews will recognize this is the man whom we rejected, who happens to be our God in the flesh. And we didn't recognize him. And that's confirmed in Revelation 1, 7. What does okay. Revelation 1, 7 say? Because behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of it. That's quoting Zechariah 12, verse 10 to 14. Yes. Yeah, I see it right here. See, there was a lot you did not know about the scripture, so you hastily rushed out of Christianity. Which I'm not attacking you, but you should have been more patient on learning the Bible thoroughly and the biblical basis for these doctrines.